Walking a path along the roots of Pikes Peak, you take a fork in the road to the Anselm Society Digital Pub. Inside is a raucous conversation on the arts, faith, and what all those wolves outside are talking about. At a corner table, by the fire, are two people. One of them is saying that he's sure he overheard one of the wolves whispering about Baba Yaga. And uh, that's me, Matthew Melema. Welcome to Believe to See. We are a podcast of the Anselm Society Arts Guild. Here at Believe to See, we explore the relationship between faith, art, and storytelling. Our goal is to help you connect the great story, the great stories, and our own stories in order to understand what it means to live with a Christian imagination. Now, of course, we over here at Believe to See love fairy tales. You know, these stories of wonder and awe arising, we like to tell ourselves, from the pure peasant folk of ancient villages. Uh, They give us a really powerful story experience. But for us in the contemporary Western world, getting this experience in an unfiltered way can be tough. Our culture over the centuries has added filter after filter to many of our best known fairy tales. You know, a century or so ago, uh, folks like Hans Christian Andersen and the Brothers Grimm helped to gather some of these stories from around Western Europe and retold them for their own time. Now, this is a good thing in a lot of ways. You know, it helped preserve the stories, and many of the retellings themselves were really well done. But this retelling also risked sanitizing and watering down the stories to make them more agreeable to their audience. And then, throughout the 20th century, Disney got a hold of a lot of these stories, and, well, you know the rest from there. But more fundamentally, we in the West just know these stories so well. And we have so many tangled webs of memories about the stories. Uh, Take Cinderella, for instance. Those of us who've studied our fairy tales know that in many of the older versions, uh, Cinderella's slipper was made of fur rather than glass. And we know that Cinderella's stepsisters cut off their toes to try to make their feet fit inside the slippers. I know all that, you know, in my head. But when I close my eyes and picture Cinderella, I still see the Disney cartoon. I'm guessing you all do as well. But luckily, there are other fairy tale traditions out there. Traditions that have all the strangeness and wonder of those older tales we know something about, but without the filters or our familiarity. And today, I want to look especially at some of those fairy tales from Russia. And for that, we have a very special guest, uh, Deacon Nicholas Kotar. He is a writer, translator, and teacher, and one of his many areas of expertise is telling the old Russian fairy tales in all of their terror and strangeness. Uh, Nicholas, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, It's such a pleasure, and what an intro. I am really (laughs) pumped up after that. This is fantastic. (laughs) So much to talk about. (laughs) Oh, I cannot wait to get to it. So, uh, yeah, I was, I was reviewing your website, seeing all the different projects you do, and, and you're involved in a lot of stuff, right? So I you, am, you write yeah. a series of Too fantasy much. books. <laughs> <laughs> You've written a series of fantasy books. Uh, you are a really accomplished teacher. You give lectures and talks all over, and you uh, have given translations of uh, some Russian fairy tales, which we're going to get to in a bit. But uh, first of all, how did you get into all this uh, Russian fairy tale business? Oh my goodness. Well, it's, it came with my mother's milk almost literally. So (laughs) there's, there's plenty of fairy tales that I could tell about my own family history, but the, uh, the short and not quite sanitized version, I'll try to give you the truth is that, uh, from both sides of my family, I come from old Russian stock. Uh, Mm -hmm. and, um, although I was born in San Francisco, uh, third generation immigrant, um, already, the, my first language was Russian. I didn't speak Russian. I didn't speak English until I was four. Uh, and this from, you know, in the, in the middle of San Francisco, not, not a city you'd think would be conducive to that sort of thing. You would be wrong though, because the area that we lived in was mostly Chinese and Russians. So you could speak either one of those languages and not know English and you'd be fine. Um, it's not like that anymore, unfortunately, but, uh, it certainly was when I grew up. And I, I remember very clearly some of my earliest memories is, the images from the old storybooks uh, that came from Russia that are very much rooted in the same sort of movement that the Grimm's were in, uh, in the 19th Mm -hmm. century, but in Russia. So it was a kind of collection of the old 
and retelling in a slightly more 19th century, maybe, maybe a little bit of more sanitized style. Um, but mm -hmm. those images, the, the beautiful artwork, and of course the characters, they were there um, so deep, in fact, that uh, when I was writing my, the series of novels that you mentioned, I, I would have these things come out as the characters kind of write themselves. Anybody who's a writer knows that this happens a lot. And when I started to come back to the fairy tales to retell them in a, in a podcast that I had called In a Certain Kingdom, I realized that there were certain things that I put in that were totally from my subconscious. They were not, not a result of research, not a result of recent reading. They were entirely from my childhood. So it's just really interesting how if you form a child in these stories, the stories will form the person going into their uh, into the rest of their lives. So in other words, the theme here is be careful what you teach them. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, I find just the neighborhood you grew up in completely fascinating. Just picturing mm. this neighborhood in San Francisco with Chinese folks speaking Chinese, Russian folks speaking Russian, and everyone yep. just getting by. That, that sounds so fascinating. So uh, uh, like I mentioned, I want to talk a lot about uh, your, your book, In a Certain Kingdom, Fairy Tales of Old Russia. Yeah. And so the, these are translations, retellings of nine specific stories. Mm -hmm. uh, so these stories, did you have to go seek them out, like uh, go to the library, do some research, or are these just stories you, you've always known? So the, the way that this book uh, came about was actually uh, as a result of a podcast that I had with Ancient Faith Media, um, which is a large Orthodox um, mm. media company. And uh, the initiative for that podcast was as much a, uh, a product of my work as it was a product of a musician named Natalie Wilson, who's a composer and a, p a pianist, very accomplished and talented musician. She actually approached me with the idea of scoring a Russian fairy tale podcast read, mm -hmm. uh, that would be read out uh, in podcast form for for specifically for ancient faith. And initially, I was skeptical, but since I was very deep in the Russian uh, fairy tale world by writing the fantasy series that I was writing at the time, which is re which I recently finished, uh, I thought it might be a good way of going back to the source and see what I might uncover from my mm -hmm. childhood memories that might deepen uh, some of the choices that I m allow my characters to make within my. Uh, fantasy novels, because it's a, it's a good thing to go back to the well of story. You know, the great cauldron as, as a, of story, as, as Tolkien calls it in, in, on, fairy, in on Fairy Stories, is a wonderful essay. Um, so it started out as me translating the stories from 19th century uh, collections, uh, picking specifically the stories that I remembered the most from my childhood. So these are the ones that every Russian child in the diaspora, as we call it, or in Russia, will know. So these are the ones that feature Baba Yaga very prominently. They feature her male counterpart, who's called Kashe the Deathless, uh, who is the, the character, the, the villain who always, who, who can't be killed and yet always dies, but then always comes back in the next story. Uh, classic tropes like like the crying prince who sits on a, um, who sits down on a, on a uh, log and cries his eyes out and only at that point receives the, the help of, um, of some magical story creature. Uh, the kinds of images and the kinds of characters that, that I remember from my childhood. And why those nine? They're the ones that, that made up season one of In a Certain Kingdom, the podcast version. Mm -hmm. So I took the one, those, they were ready, they were all translated, and uh, I decided to package them up, put a nice cover on them, um, and uh, start selling them online. Um, through my own publishing company, uh, which uh, the same company that publishes that publishes my uh, fantasy novel. So that was the that was the beginning of the project, and um, it's been an ongoing kind of uh, relationship with these stories as we go. Because I told those stories, uh, and then I, I ended up going deeper into the into the fairy tale tradition to tell other stories that are from slightly different with slightly different emphases for more, a more epic, heroic, uh, poetic tradition. But I keep coming back to these again and again, and uh, they really do form the bedrock of the, the storytelling style and the storytelling choices that I make as a writer. So the, this, is, this is the heart of the matter. <laughs> so, so let's take a minute with the title, because you, like you said, it, it starts off in a certain kingdom. Now, if we were going to do things about like the, the fairy tales of, you know, Western Europe, it would be called Once Upon a Time. Yes. Uh, is there significance in using the, the phrase in a certain kingdom instead? Yes, it's a stock, it's a stock phrase. 
uh, the the phrase in Russian, and I'll say it in Russian for anybody who might actually know the language, but it is "nekaterim tsarstvi в некотором государстве." So there's there's a bit of rhyming and, assin- and assonance in there, mm-hmm. and it it's the direct translation is "in a certain kingdom, in a certain government, or something like this," but it sounds terrible in English. So <laughs> the way that I translate it is in, "in a certain kingdom, in a certain land." Dot dot dot. The the mm-hmm. story um, moves on. It's um for a Russian ear, it's a perfect. Uh, trigger and it immediately mm-hmm. activates the awareness of the child who already knows the story of course or the the story world to start paying attention um, but it's not the beginning of the story and this is something that's very odd and very interesting and is not something that i include in my fairy tale uh, collection because it's too weird but if i was a proper russian storyteller what i would do is i would tell a pre-story to Ooh. the story and the pre-story is a bunch of nonsense that has nothing to do with the story. It has nothing to do with anything. It's usually just a collection of bizarre words strung together, bizarre images strung together that aren't connected. Sometimes they're violent. Sometimes they're funny. Sometimes they're disturbing. Uh, the purpose of, of this, uh, it turns out, is to reawaken the listener to the awareness that the storytelling space is a dream space. And since we're always in the world and we're always doing our material reality stuff and, and work and, and, th- and family and thinking too much, and this is even in, you know, in, the, in, the pre-indust- in pre-industrial Russia, you still had that problem like we all do today. The storyteller had to shock people out of reality and back into the deeper reality of the dream, which is childhood, right? Which is an awareness of the liminal, an awareness uh, of the ineffable, an awareness of the kind of piercing through the veil of materiality of that immaterial reality that we all know exists out there. So it's just bizarre enough. It's just jagged enough to get people to go, what's going on? And then at the end of it, usually in the, in the middle of a sentence, there isn't even a period at the end of the sentence, the cadence changes and the storyteller goes, in a certain kingdom, in a certain land, there was a prince. And then, so at that point, the listeners are like, okay, I'm, I'm ready. Here we go. Tell me, tell me the rest, please. Because they've been so disoriented by the pre-tale, by the madness that they just heard, the violence, the craziness, that now they're ready for a reorientation of reality along its proper deep roots, which is, of course, you know, the heroic tale, the tale of the, of the hero or the heroine overcoming great odds to attaining some goal, whether it's under an, a deeper understanding of the world or it's uh, love or it's gold or it's uh, something along those lines like all the fairy tales do that is so fascinating and i have so many questions uh, <laughs> you ever hear something you're like i'm gonna go down an internet rabbit hole about yes, this later yes, um, yes. so i have so many questions uh, one of them is were there like stock phrases that be used for these pre-stories or, or does storyteller just sort of rattle off whatever's going on in their head so probably the, probably there was a little bit of both and it's hard to tell mm-hmm. because, unfortunately, the authentic uh, oral storytelling traditions, as they were before the revolution in Russia, uh, are mostly gone. Um, the last mm-hmm. living storyteller, in the sense of the past, the oral tradition being passed on, pro- died in during the Soviet Union, probably around the 60s or 70s, and without mm-hmm. without a proper um, apprentice to be able to learn. So whatever we have now is written um, artifacts of what was entirely an oral culture. So we don't really know. But if we were to guess, it was probably a little bit of both. And especially if you go really back in history, there, it would have all probably been invented from, from the mind of the storyteller. But as such things happen, storytelling tropes form as, as a result of these patterns kind of accumulating around a shared experience, right? Some images, mm-hmm. some words, some phrases just resonate more and you can see it in the eyes of the of the listener. You can see their eyes light up, light up at a certain combination of sounds, at a certain combination of words. So the pretale will have certain stock phrases, definitely. Um, at what point did those become stock phrases, and what at what point were they um, invented purely based on the inspiration of the of the storyteller? That's much harder to say. But I I do think, and this is purely my my own opinion. Um, it's not I'm not a scholar uh, of of story. I'm not a mythologist. But this is this is what I think is the case. I think probably the stock phrases are more common in the story itself, and mm. the and the pre story is more open to the freedom of the storyteller to choose the 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 most chaotic version for the audience that is in front of him or her. Um, so I think that's probably what it would have been like. 
That is so interesting. Uh, so it sounds like a lot of these storytellers then, they it was totally oral tradition. Yeah. Were, were a lot of these storytellers even literate, or, or is this all just memorization? I mean, a lot of them were totally illiterate. So this, wow. this, is, this is classic oral tradition. Uh, in the deep, deep um, you know, countryside of, of, of far Siberia. Mm-hmm. So even if they are literate, uh, the storytelling portion of their knowledge is not doesn't come from written sources. They would not have read uh, the tales that they told. They would have heard them. Um, they would have learned to, to speak them. They would have learned to sing them. And then they would have learned the proper techniques and how to allow your own particular flavor of telling to... Um, clash together with the tropes but then also mm. dance with them a little bit because you all, you all you all have to allow for for the authentic voice of the storyteller to come through there's always mm. that freedom but the tropes then become a kind of um there's actually a, there's a lot of freedom in having those tropes because they give you a guidepost and you know that you're supposed to go you're supposed to go in that general direction how you get there is less important and the stock phrases in the stories help that as well because it can anchor the storyteller or it can also anchor the listener uh, both together. So in those moments where the stock phrases and the stock characters are used, everybody kind of goes, okay, I know where this is going. And then it, then it can go back out into the freedom of the individual storyteller. Uh, it's something I'm thinking about a lot for myself because um, the first version of In a Certain Kingdom, the first two seasons of it as, as it existed before, was me reading translations. So it was not me practicing mm-hmm. in the in the authentic way but Mm. since then i've i've had some contact with martin shaw with dr martin shaw who's a very famous mythologist and uh probably one of the best storytellers live storytellers that we have he was raised in a shamanic shamanic um tradition of storytelling so very much an oral tradition and uh he's his recommendations in how to approach these stories that are that are now very much written artifacts has inspired me to try out um not in an authentic way. This is not from a tradition. This is just me trying it, trying things out for myself as a very postmodern person. But it's the best I can do uh, to try out, you know, a bit more of that live, uh, uninhibited way of telling. Um, so the podcast as it was is now defunct and there's going to be a new version of it coming out soon, which will feature uh, the sa- not the same music, but music from the same composer and uh, storytelling mm-hmm. styles that are at least in theory, a little bit more in line with what an oral storyteller would have done in Russia, perhaps in the late 19th or early 20th century. That is so interesting. So I'm thinking, um, listening to a lecture one time, uh, just using these same principles, but going back to like uh, the Iliad, right? Yeah. So trying to like take what we know from like more recent bards in Mm -hmm. like what you touched on. One of the problems is by the time scientists become interested in preserving this, they're already dying out. That's so right. what we know is limited. Yeah. But they're like l- looking like, oh, these stock phrases like Hector, tamer of horses, like mm-hmm. swift-footed Achilles. The- these are like little anchor points or little memory aids that we have for the bards. Is, yes. is something similar going on with the tropes for the Russian bards? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, def- that's, that's definitely the case. The, and it's there's not that many of them. So the Iliad would have required a lot, something like the Iliad, that tradition of, of storytelling would have been a lot more uh, technical, I think, uh, because you have to have the poetic form um, down and, and there's music involved in things. The, the oral storyteller uh, has stock, stock phrases and stock characters, but those, there's a very limited um, stock of them. Um, and you can repeat them because fairy tales are, unlike epic poetry, are much more comfortable with the tropes repeating multiple times. And in fact, the more you repeat it, the more the, the listener understands that understands that they're in fairy tale land not epic hero land which is which is related but not the same mm-hmm. right it's a, it's tell it's telling a different kind of story in a different kind of way and accessing a different kind of experience for the listener so yeah they're there and um any russian even nowadays even in, in a fully literate culture will recognize them uh well, some of them include things like the morning is wiser than the evening which is which is a, a ver- fairly repeated stock phrase uh, and of course, the beginning of the story in a certain king in a certain land, or beyond the thrice nine thrice ninth kingdom, is a stock phrase that tells you we're mm-hmm. going to go on a dif- on a, a distant journey to a magical mm-hmm. land that may have Edenic qualities to it. So uh, that sort of thing, yeah. Beyond the thrice ninth kingdom, I love that. And, and again, it's like like you said, sort of sets the stage and lets the reader know, okay, 
We're going into like fairyland here, folks. We're, yep. we're leaving what you know behind. Yeah, and even so in these, fairy, even in fairyland, there are thresholds, right? So, like the beginning of the story, you're very much in the city, you're very much in the kingdom, and then the character has to cross the threshold within the story world, where he leaves the confines of the city walls and goes into the woods, right? Where everything anything's possible, where magic lives, where mm-hmm. where the, where magical creatures uh, exist, where where you know wolves talk, where Baba Yaga lives. So there's this there's these levels, right? There's these embedded uh, levels of reality that that, ev- that everybody is navigating the, the listener the um, the teller and the characters and in that dance of of embedded realities there's a really deep expression of what it means to be alive uh, so that's what yeah. part of what makes these these stories so powerful and the stock phrases they're kind of a shortcut right they, they allow the reader to go okay I understand and then it's not just the the recognition of it but it's a, almost like a psychic um, uh, um, tool to help you go deeper into what the story might be telling you. So you're no longer on the surface of it. You understand the surface so that you can really delve and start deeper and start thinking about oh, on the level of your heart. Like, what is it that the story is telling me? What is the deeper spiritual reality that the story is expressing? And you're not thinking about that in a rational way, but the stock phrases help you just descend more deeply into it, almost mm-hmm. like liturgy, right? Almost like ritual mm-hmm. incantation in some way, without it being magical in any sort of uh, dangerous way, right? But just this is how human experience, especially in community, especially around a fire, especially in a place where um, you have shared experiences over generations. That's how it works. That's how you have these deep connections that then end up forming, um, you know, the life journey for a lot of people in, in ways that are that are quite strong and ineffable. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I can totally see that where you have the, the stock phrase, you have like the pre story, you have all this to sort of like the orient the listener's mind to be like, okay, we're leaving the world that you, you know, experience with your senses all the time where we're going into this different place. A- yeah. Absolutely. So, so let's, uh, so final question, uh, because I, I feel like I could talk for like five hours just about the <laughs> mechanics of the bards because I find it so fascinating. But one final question, what, what would be the, the environment where you'd hear the, these bards tell the stories? Would it be like around the dining table with the big group? Is it around the campfire? Is it sort of just outside someone's hut? How would that happen? I mean, I think all of those probably would be, would be possible. Um, you would, you would have it with the mother in the, in the bedroom with all of her children uh, getting ready for bed. You would have a traveling uh, storyteller come in. This is a person of great respect, somebody that you, that the entire community collects money and food for, uh, and that would be in some sort of central place, might be around a fire. I, I tend to think that probably fires would play an important role in this just because fi- there's something about staring at fire that is, <laughs> that is very conducive <laughs> storytelling. I don't know what it is, but yeah, I think, I think all of that would have been, uh, would have been true. And um, just because the, these are stories that are primarily part of peasant oral culture. So mm-hmm. it would, they would be told in places where the community meets, uh, whether that's outside during the summer, most likely, uh, or inside in, in one of the larger huts, one of the, one of the, um, not like, not like you'd have a community hall in a village, you wouldn't, but perhaps some place where, where, or one of the larger houses, you would invite everybody over. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes it was just as, it was just a spontaneous thing, but you did have traveling, um, bards that would go from village to village and, and make their living that way. Definitely. So, so now let's talk about the stories themselves. So you, you mentioned earlier that the nine stories you chose for, for your book, uh, In a Certain Kingdom, in, in which you in turn got for your podcast, there's sort of nine that you mentioned that, especially a lot of the Russian diaspora w- were familiar with. Like these are nine core stories. And yeah. I, I'm, I'm interested to know how these these nine became so core. Because, you know, for, for Western fairy tales, again, we, you know, there's the origin story with, you know, Hans Christian Andersen, Brothers Grimm, collecting them, sort of putting them into a, a book and kind of formalizing them. Yeah. Did something similar happen with Russian fairy tales or did they get, get into the communal psyche in a different way? Yeah, something similar happened. Uh, and I think if we're talking about the kinds of stories that that people, especially in uh, in the elite dra- diaspora, so you have to understand that after the um, the revolution, that most of the people that left Russia were either um, r- uh, clergy stock or um, mm. the upper echelons of society, because they're the, they were the ones that were the most uh, persecuted by the by the incoming government, by the communist government. Um, so it would have been an elite culture that was taken out. So this, I'm talking specifically about this kind of elite culture as it came to me. No, I'm not talking about. Uh, passed on oral culture as it was 
in in the deep in the deeper kind of countryside of Russia, where you would have a different um, familiarity with a different cycle that would probably be more local and less universally Russian. So what I'm talking about is kind of a historical anomaly. But that being the case, what, it is a very interesting historical anomaly because it is a reflection of a fascinating uh, period in Russian history. So like in a lot of places in Europe, the mid-late 19th century um, saw a rise in, in nationalism and patriotism, two words mm -hmm. that you know nowadays we're supposed to scoff at. But this was a, a period of flowering of native cultures in throughout Europe. And it was a period of some of the best music, classical music we've ever seen, some of the best artwork uh, we've ever seen, some of the best storytelling, some of the best uh, long-form fiction. And a lot of it came about in, in, a, in a very rich flowering of local culture that, that the elites woke up to. So it, wasn't a, it was less a matter of we are Russian, everyone else is other, which is how we tend to think about nationalism these days. It was much more about look at this richness that we have in our own, cult, in our own history, in our own people, in our own society that we've been neglecting because we've been more globalist in a, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Because the time of Napoleon, right before, there was, a, there was this push in Russia to really become more European and less yeah. backward, stilted Russian. This Russification movement, this awakening to, uh, of the Russian consciousness to itself, to, pay, to uh, peasant culture, to folk themes, to folk ideas, to folk motifs, completely overtook the elite culture. So you have people starting mm -hmm. to build massive country houses in the style of small village houses but like blown up massively you have folk motifs show up in architecture all over the place including the building of churches you have iconography uh which in the in the 17th and 18th century started to look a lot more like realistic painting in the uh post-renaissance style in, in um in europe begin to take on a flavor of russian folk painting uh, especially in the works of of artists like uh, Bilibin and Vasnetsov, two fantastic uh, artists who are still very well known throughout the world today, the that kind of flowering of folk culture in an in a more elite setting um, gave rise to a desire to find the old stories, uh, collect them in some meaningful way, and then use use them um, in that collected form to preserve them. Right, so there were uh, grim uh, analogs in Russia. One of them was a man named uh, uh, Afanasyev, and his collections are still the most popular, in, both in Russia and abroad. So, collections of, of Afanasyev's fairy tales are the ones that will have the most sales on Amazon. They're the ones that have the most reviews. They're the ones that tend to be the most widespread, partially because some of the best artists collaborated with Afanasyev mm. as a translator to create absolutely gorgeous collections of illustrated fairy tales, both in small booklet format and in larger collection format, where you had these full page sized illustrations um, of, of these fairy tales that were done in, in gorgeous late 19th century folk, also folk realistic style that, that, some, that is unparalleled in, in the history of, of Russia before and after. So that's where the stories came to uh, those of us who had to hold on to our Russianness in the diaspora. Uh, mm -hmm. They were in the collections that were the most popular in the late 19th century, which was the last flourishing of culture before, before World War I and before the, um, the end of, of imperial Russian culture and the coming on of, of communism. So that's the, that's the sort of long and convoluted answer to why those stories are meaningful to me as, as a Russian living outside of Russia. But it's also why they will be very recognizable for people in Russia because they, they continue to be published even during the Soviet times, as the mo as the ones that were most in the public memory, the, mo the ones in the most in the public knowledge, uh, the ones that are most associated with the thing that is Russia that is different from everyone else, and that was a very important thing during communism, right? To 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 really focus in on what is ours at the ex you know and push out everything else. It was it was so important for the communists to preserve that freshness that had happened at the end of the 19th and early 20th century that. Which that there was an inevitable degradation of culture in, in the communist times because they didn't allow for the kind of free uh, thinking, free create, creative uh, expression that you need to have that kind of a flourishing. So you immediately started to have a, a decline in culture. Um, so they had to preserve that by upholding previous examples of um, 
superior Russianness. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not what I mean, but you know what I mean. Like the, this, the, the greatest examples of what we have to offer that the world will appreciate. But it got so bad that they actually, this is kind of an aside, but I think it's it's an interesting one for your, for your listeners. They would take translations of famous international works like Dr. Doolittle, uh, like Pinocchio, like... Um, those are those are the two that come to mind uh, immediately. They would rename all the characters, they would change the story slightly, and they would slap on the name of a Russian and say, "This is a Russian story." And the Russian versions of those international stories are now Russian classics in Russia. Like <laughs> tr- children know those stories by heart, even though they don't look like the originals, they don't sound like the originals. It's v- it's very strange, and this this went so far. This tendency in Russian translation to translate the names and the and to translate the stories to change them went so far that the official uh, recognized translation of the Lord of the Rings in Russian actually translates the names. So the names are not Frodo Baggins. The name of Frodo Baggins in the Russian version is Frodo Torbins, because the word for bag is Torba. So they literally translated the name. <laughs> And it's, it's utterly bizarre, but it all comes from this, you know, desire to, to show off the, the unique flowering of folk culture that happened at the end of the 19th century. And that's where the stories come, come from, um, yeah, especially in the, in the form that I tell them in, in, in a certain kingdom has those translations. Those are mostly Athanasius translations. Yeah. And, and that is uh, the, the next question I had for you where, um, again, like I'm, you, you know, using it through my lens of knowing about like Brothers Grimm and all those where that, that sort of becomes more or less the definitive version yeah, until like yeah. Disney gets a hold of it. Then that becomes a popular one. Right. W- would you say your versions owe the most to, to those versions that you talked about or did, were you uh, incorporating other versions as well? No, for in, in the versions that you see them in the book, um, they are direct translations of those 19th century co- collectors. Mm. Uh, so those 19th century collectors, what they would have done, they would have collated different versions of a lot of stories. And in some of their collections, they would have included all the different versions. But in other smaller, more um, more publisher-friendly versions, they would have then probably taken different versions and combined them to make a more seamless narrative. And those combined seamless ones are the ones that everybody knows really well. And I've actually started to do some research on this just for for myself and on my own. There are some stories that are very ancient that in the 19th century were collated incorrectly. So you have Hmm. certain tales that were the first half of the tale is a very, very old story. Like from, you can tell that the images are from like the ninth or 10th century. They're, they hark back to a pre-Christian paganism that, that is, animistic and kind of very, very, very ancient. And then the second half of the story uses uh, tropes and images from the first half, but in a way that is completely contradictory to the, the, to the first half of the story. So oh. the scholars, like the, the tellers and the listeners don't, don't pay attention because the story still flows and it's still beautiful. But scholars have gone back and they've, they've gone, okay, that section, the second section, that's a, that's a 19th century edition yeah. from a different story. So I've actually started to consider maybe T- taking some of the stories in their really old form, reading them mm-hmm. and start to start retelling them in a way that is maybe slightly older, slightly more authentic. But of course, through the lens of a very postmodern person living in 21st century upstate New York. So eh, what can you do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that, that is, and that goes to the complication of this whole thing, right? Because, you know, there, there's this impulse that this impulse I totally get, right? Mm-hmm. You know, the intellectuals, uh, academics in Russia, and, and you saw the you know similar thing with you know German stories, the the yeah. folk tales, and, and yeah, you yeah. know across Western Europe, where it's like we want to find our authentic stories. You know, we're we're proud of like our people. This is our thing. So let's do it. But then yeah. when you dig down into the nitty gritty, it gets really complicated, right? Because yeah, you know, there's there's a million different versions. You picture these bards going from little town to little town. Those stories get retold and retold. Mm-hmm. My baby, one of the bards picked up a story from like, uh, from like a, but a friend of a friend in France and that gets into it. And, and yeah. there's cross pollination. So sure. there's just so many things to deal with. And, and the, the question I have based off of that is you mentioned how a lot of these, um, people who would chronicle the stories would give like the different versions of it. Mm -hmm. So when you're coming to this as, you know, a modern translator storyteller, 
How do you make the decision about which version to go with? Oh, it's it's intuition. So it's the story <laughs> that feels the most uh, the most real. So there's just some stories that that look. It's it's a it's a really interesting thing. This is true of both oral story oral storytelling and the canonical literature. Mm -hmm. There is something about the good stories that just resonates with a huge number of people. Maybe not everyone, but there's something about the, the great ones, the, the canonical ones, the, they just, they have, they, they somehow access or somehow are able to reflect the deeper reality of what it means to be alive, mm -hmm. that all stories are trying to reflect in a way that is just more powerful than all the others. It's just, there's something about it. So I, I'm, I'm reading, rereading the Chronicles of Prydain by Lloyd Alexander for myself right now. I was reading mm. him to my son, my nine-year-old son, but he couldn't wait for me to finish it. He just finished the whole thing himself because I was too slow <laughs> in my reading to him. So I, I started reading, rereading them, my third reread. I love those stories. Uh, and in each of those rereads, it was book four, Terran Wonder that just stood apart from all the rest. No matter that it wasn't the last book, it didn't have all of the catharsis, didn't have the final victory of good over evil. It didn't have all the tropes th uh, that are common in fantasy literature. And I just reread it for the last time recently and I'm, I'm reading it and I'm weeping and I'm like, this is deep literature. Even though it's 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 a children's story. I mean, he's not, he doesn't write it any ornamented style. He doesn't go deep into the psychological states of the characters. He doesn't do much. It's a very simply written story, mm -hmm. but it's a fairy tale. And he mm -hmm. uses imagery and characters and tropes that have appeared again and again and again in different storytelling traditions, including Russian fairy tales, in ways that are just utterly magical. And so there's something, there's something where the heart goes, this is it. This is the one. And you just go with it. You don't think about it too much. You go with it. You just pick it. Because <laughs> you can't be wrong, right? Who's going to go and tell you that was the wrong version, man? And if that, if, I'm sure there are some people that are like, well, you used, you know, and they'll give you some designation of a trope and say, that trope isn't supposed to be with that trope. Those people don't like stories, so I don't listen to them. <laughs> That you will see the occasional academic who does that, right? They like list all the different things that can happen in a fairy tale. And it's yeah. like a grid. It's like, oh, dude, I, you, you're these supposed to be fun what's going yeah, on you, here um, you eviscerated the story congratulations <laughs> and you're trying to tell me that you yeah. like the stuff yeah i don't believe you <laughs> yeah it used to be a living thing and you just sort of stuck a pin in it and put it on your board but mm -hmm. um yep so to to that and this question i that i'm about to ask you might be impossible to answer so let me preface it with that okay. um <laughs> So a lot of our listeners may have, you know, some familiarity with Russian, you know, fairytales. Again, like we've heard of Baba Yaga, but, but maybe not much beyond that. Mm -hmm. Where, whereas you, you have the, this native appreciation of Russian fairy tales. And I'm guessing just through your life growing up in America, you, you know a lot about, you know, typical Western fairy tales. Sure. If you're to look at them from like the 30,000 foot view, do you mm -hmm. think there's a, there's some like difference between the two, the two types of fairy tales? Uh, well, the, it depends on how you want to look at it, right? I mean, there's there's a lot of there's a lot in common. Uh, there certainly mm -hmm. is. Uh, there are there are repeated patterns and repeated tropes and repeated things that happen that are simply a reflection of a common a common storytelling urge that all humans have. And these are the te these tend to be the kinds of things that Tolkien talks about in on fairy stories. The kinds of things mm -hmm. that re that appear across storytelling traditions, no matter where you are no matter what the connections or lack of connections are. And he, of course, brings it uh, in, in his mythic consciousness to, to a kind of prophecy to the coming of Christ and how, how Christ's hmm. heroic journey on earth was a kind of fulfillment of all fairy tale and mythic um, expectations, right? So that you do have that, that kind of similarity. That being said, I think there definitely is something about the Russian fairy tales that contrasts with the, with the um, Western ones just by virtue of their being extremely weird and chaotic it's the, to the, to the Western imagination, which really likes, I mean, if you're going to be talking about Western fairy tales, primarily coming through the, the uh, lens of the Grimm's and I'm going to be doing some cultural, um, not appropriation, but uh, generalization here, but it's a bunch of Germans uh, gathering a bunch of <laughs> stories that you're, they're going to be pretty, you know, they're going to be pretty orderly, right? Um, that did not happen in Russia. The stories are, are, they're nuts. They're utterly nuts. And if you, if you have, and the thing is the further removed you are from, from the rooted, uh, 
the rooted soil of the culture that gave rise to these stories, the weirder the things sound. But the more you learn about what it what it means to be Russian, the more you understand about the Russian religious mindset, the more you learn about the Russian peasant lifestyle, the more you understand the way Russians think, the way they the way they feel, the way they tend to look at the world. And of course, I am very much generalizing, but there are certain things that you can mm-hmm. always do with that. The more you understand that these weird, crazy things, they, they are not random. They, they're very shocking, but sometimes they're intended to be shocking. Uh, they're, mm-hmm. they're very chaotic, but life is chaotic. And if you think about... <clears throat> what it means to be a Russian through the 1,000 years of absolutely insane chaotic history with a lot of bloodshed, with a lot of revolt, with a lot of internal and external dissent, wars, rumors of wars. It's not surprising that the fairy tale tradition embraces a storytelling style that is very high on the chaotic level. <laughs> um, that being said, there, you know, the happily ever after is all is almost always there. So, Yeah. So, so let's let's maybe to get into some examples of the the craziness. Like, can you give an example of something from these stories that we would be like, that is absolutely bonkers? But then maybe when viewed in context, might make more sense within the within the story. Well, yeah, the 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 probably the most obvious ones are examples of sudden and unexpected violence. But um, so in the first tale in the in the collection is the tale of Prince Ivan and the Gre- and the uh, the Grey Wolf, which is a very famous Russian fairy tale. And in that fairy tale, Prince Ivan um, enjoys the the help of a magical creature. Um, at the end of his journey, he parts with uh, the talking wolf, but he does so in as we find out in a way that is um, not expedient for his future. He goes and, and falls asleep with all of his good, the goods that he received during his during his uh, journeys, including an uh, ideal expression of beauty in the form of a princess that is the most beautiful woman in the world. Uh, falls asleep at the at the foot of a tree. At which point, his two brothers, who were looking for the same things, come by and chop him into a bunch of little pieces, and then right off, <clears throat> right. Uh, and that should be in the tale. No, the wolf comes back, <laughs> catches a raven. No, catches a, the baby of a raven and says, I'm going to eat your baby. And the raven goes, no, no, don't, don't, like, I'll do whatever you want, wolf, don't eat my baby. And the wolf goes, fly to the end of the world and get me the water of death. And the raven's like, okay, whatever. Like, he flies to the end of the world, brings him the water of death. And he pours the water of death on the body of the prince. And the water of death makes the pieces come together. And so the body is whole again. And the raven goes, please give me back my baby. And the, the gray wolf goes, no, I'm going to eat him. He's really tasty. I can tell already. Oh, please, do, just tell me what to do. Go get me the water of life, says the gray wolf. So the raven goes, because the raven is very wise. He knows where the water of life is. And he goes and brings it back, and he pours it on top, and Yvonne wakes up. And he goes, oh, what a strange dream I had. Things like this, right? So, you know, <laughs> these things happen routinely. The, the death of the deathless one is on the end of a needle, which is inside an egg, which is inside a uh, rabbit, which is inside a duck, which is inside an eagle, which is inside a chest. And the chest is on top of a tree. And the tree is guarded by a bear. <laughs> Are you getting it? <laughs> oh, I, I mean, you can really picture the Russian bards just like going, like adding layer and layer, and like the people laughing the whole time. Like that's yeah. really, that's really interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I, I I will say um, that story had a couple turns. First, when the guy's brothers chop him up, leave him in peace, and then just just leave him there. Yep. After they take his stuff, and then water. De- okay, wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that is so interesting. Yeah. So what? We're, we're we're running a little bit low on time. We 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 only have time for me like one or one or two more questions. But you you did mention that a lot of these stories do have. Would it be fair to say happy endings, good consolations at the end? Sure. Is that true? Yes. And if so, why, why do you think that is such a key aspect of these fairy tales? Well, I mean, it, it's it's one thing 
Now, probably the stock answer is that any storyteller in a traditional culture, which is going to be which is going to be pre-industrial, which is going to be in a world that's filled with a lot of chaos, with a lot of death, with a lot of infant mortality, with a lot of you know rumor wars and rumors of wars, and just with the possibility of the neighboring village coming in and stealing all your food in a bad winter, you know a lot of people just wouldn't have had access to a lot of. <clears throat> A resolution of that kind and there's a lot to be said about about communal catharsis through storytelling um enacting a, a a lack in people's individual lives in ways that aren't simply wish fulfillment but allow them par- to participate in a kind of eternal uh pattern that they know exists and so kind of the imp- empathetic connection between the character and the listener is a way for them to at least have access to feeling that joy of resolution that maybe they won't have in this life, but they certainly will have if they persist to the end. And of course, this begs the question, yes, these fairy tales are entirely within a Christian context. So they can only, the happy ending can only exist because the happy ending has already happened. Because as Tolkien said, the catastrophe of history has occurred. And you know, no, no Russian fairy, fairy tale teller would ever use that kind of language, of course, but every teller and every listener understands that these stories, although they come from a pre-Christian Russia, they are a reflection very much of a long process of the folk coming to terms with what it means to be baptized, what it means to be Christian, and how the final consolation of the fairy tales, the final consolation of the Christianization of Russia, that, that the culture that was pagan has been taken, has been baptized, it has not been destroyed, it's been transformed, it's been offered up as a, as a new thing, and in the end, it's something that transforms, and it gives the taste of that, you know, joy poignant as grief that, that Tolkien talks about all the time, that even if they won't have access to it uh, to a great degree in, in this life, they certainly will in the next. And it, it's, a, it's a teaching tool. It's an expression of what it means to be alive. Uh, and it's a reminder. It's a reminder that, that joy is possible, even in the midst of grief. No, I, I love that. And I, I do think that is why it's so important to keep the context in mind, right? It's like, yeah. If you're a peasant in a pre-industrial society, you know about heartache, you know about terror, you know about uncertainty, not knowing if you're going to live or die. You know this, right? Like the the thing, that's not what you need in your story, right? You you need exactly what you're talking about and being reoriented toward the, toward the things above what's right in front of you. Mm -hmm. I I love that description that you gave. Um, So unfortunately we are, running very short on time. But before we go, uh, where can listeners find out more about you? Uh, what do you have in the hopper coming up that we should be aware of? Uh, where, where can we find all you and all your stuff? Oh, thank you. The, uh, you can find everything I do on my website, nicholaskotar.com. I will say that there is a time-sensitive um, opportunity for those of you who are uh, writers or aspiring writers. I'm giving a, uh, a webinar next Thursday. So that's Thursday, July 27th at 8 p.m. about the three most common um, writing problems that all writers face and how to fix them. So if that's something that you're interested in, just go to my website and you will see a uh, download link for that there. All right, great. And I'll, I'll give another plug for your website. I, I spent some time on this um, as I was preparing for the it, for the I was like, oh, this is super interesting. So there's your in a certain kingdom, which like we we've been discussing fairy tales. You have another one that's related, but it's like the more the epic tales of of old Russia. Mm-hmm. Then you have your your own uh, book series uh, as well. Yep. And I I just think it's totally fascinating. One hundred percent recommend. Like if if you're the like listeners, come on. <laughs> if you're the person who's uh, listening to Believe to See, listening to this podcast, you're, you're going to love it. Um, so once again, uh, Nicholas Kotar, thank you so much. This has been so interesting. And as you listeners can probably tell, things are winding down at the Anselm Society Digital Pub. The fire is down to embers. The customers are trundling home. And I'm getting ready to go down a YouTube wormhole, wormhole learning all about the pre-stories <laughs> from Russian bards. <laughs> Once again, Believe to See is a podcast of the Anselm Society Arts Guild. If you have about 32 or so seconds to spare right now, uh, please rate and review the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for listening, and we will catch you next time.